year, for the past several years, we've tried to do an international panel. NAPCRAG is not just North American, it's an international um, organization, and we try to bring together voices from different countries represented by NAPCRAG on an issue that's important uh, and crosses borders. Today's plenary is a panel of speakers from three indigenous communities, two in Canada and one in the U.S., as well as several NAPCRAG members discussing the importance of raising the knowledge and awareness of ways in which research can be co-created with indigenous communities, subsequently contributing to the health and wellness of those communities. Je l'honneur de vous présenter le Dr. Anne McCauley. I'm very honored to invite Dr. Anne McCauley and her colleagues to the podium. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, we're extremely honored uh, this morning that NAPCRAG invited Dr. Graham to board of academic and community research. Uh, good morning, plenary present. But we will begin by inviting Elder Amelia Iguadoni um, to uh, stay to say opening words in the traditional Mohawk way. Ne <laughs> Honest on Uzara than on there was a head that I saw. I always did joke the gargaya, and you ought to neglect the gora. Took only the tin over a do gargaya, and then the kinados ne goodilio. As the gara de one a ward on nena, who didn't have the doors done, and a yuka that could eat and a neck on your gehaga. Judge go on in on next year, canad in a gayeli nigger where I get a no on in a. Yoskats did what got us, Negaga and Eki Nistaha, then Kenados Nena, Jokeneka Garakwa, then a warning there, Asutaka Garakwa, Joga de Ayuna Dagari, the Gahiziga, the Lungaga, Joga de Dot Gatos, Ne, Oniotu Negat Nigura, Joka Oni get one of Radu Nega, no Nes Nene, the Kenados Ne, Gurunda, so other no Ogule, so. Yoga did the Watsta Mene Aganusta, the Watsta, Tony Otto Neguanigura. Sok only the one who were hard in a gargaine, as a tonk a garaqua, Gioscuts to the Watkatos, Ne, Gununga Naguadin, and he did you walk it. Tony Otto Neguanigura. Sok only the guys were tunta de, the what used to be so coronio de gargaine, the Watkatos, and you to sire. Then I got it was see jacket in your soon this. I always get joke there. Took on it. I had to make an over hard on a gun guy and a big kidney star. The newly was cut scut nearly the old and a mess to go at this. Took on it. Took on what do ten as we get Nicola. When you ought to Niguana. Took 
Sonyore, what got the new what queen, you took a tennis or get me going hot, one in his accounts of what's called to the name. What I mean, I always get is a sort of sutra. One in twenty or what got the new what queen, you took a tennis or get me going hot, one in his accounts of what a sutra. I always get scorned to the dead what tolerance in your miseries. One in it took me go. They go to the you just. Now what you was got the whole cell. Now what one. Thank you, Amelia. It's a good way to start to bring all our minds together. Uh, next. So this is an outline of outline of our presentation this morning. And just a few words on terminology. We've chosen the word indigenous to be all encompassing to include Native American, Alaska Native from the US, indigenous, Aboriginal, First Nations, Metis and Inuit from Canada, Aborigine from Australia and Maori from New Zealand. And you may also hear other words including Native and Indian. Uh, this helicopter research was a derogatory term uh, given to earlier community research when researchers made all the decision about the research process. This quote comes from a younger Mohawk uh, colleague of mine who was an experience this as a subject in one of these uh, research undertakings. This research approach is very disrespect disrespectful to community. If the researchers benefited, the communities were frequently stigmatized, stigmatized with negative results published without context and caused huge mistrust of researchers and the research process. And this top-down research just supported the ongoing colonization uh, for indigenous peoples. So today there's increasing acceptance of community-engaged research. Again, a few words about terminology. Community-engaged research is, has really um, the expression that's evolved over the last few years. Um, earlier, you may have heard terms such as participatory research, action research, community-based participatory research. The key in all of this partnership approach to research is the, ne the necessity to, to develop uh, respectful and responsible partnerships. also important to know that there's uh, significant guidelines for uh, research with indigenous peoples. In the early days, uh, the American Indian Law Center back in 1994 were the first to publish their recommendations for guidelines. And since then, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia have all developed national policies. So researchers now must follow these guidelines in order to get research grants and in order to get ethic, ethical approf, approval. And with this brief introduction, we will now hear from three indigenous community academic partnerships, uh, two in Canada and one from the US. And so I'm very proud to stand here to, to present a few slides about the Ganawagi Schools Diabetes Prevention Project. Uh, Ganawagi uh, Mohawk Territory is home to the, to the Haudenosaunee uh, people of the Longhouse, part of the Six Nations uh, Iroquois Confederacy, Confederacy. Here on the south shore of Montreal, uh, close to where we are today, very important to know that com community has taken control of education and of health. And this means that the community has the opportunity to introduce programs um, that they believe um, are better suited to the community than again outside um, programs that can be um, implemented um, by other organizations um, and governments. So just briefly, 
Ganawagi Schools Diabetes Prevention Project, KSDPP, started in 1994 at the request of the community, at the request of people, elders in the community, uh, like Amelia, who had come to know of the high prevalence of type 2 diabetes in the community and the high prevalence of the complications um, of diabetes. So from the beginning, this project has been grounded in community engagement and Mohawk philosophy, uh, which includes consensus building. From the beginning, it's promoted healthy eating and physical activity, both in the schools and throughout the community, building, uh, creating uh, supportive environments, and from the beginning, undertaking both academic and community training. 2001 came the development of the KSDPP training program in diabetes prevention, uh, developed by a very key member of, the, um, of KSDPP, and this um, is available to other indigenous communities, obviously building capacity in those communities. 2006 came the evolution of the interventions, which included sleep, uh, culture, sovereignty, and mind, body, spirit. Also came the development, again in partnership with the schools, um, and again using uh, research for baseline results and incorporating baseline results with national recommendations to develop school policies to support nutrition and physical activity. And today, the newer uh, projects are mentoring youth, who in turn are mentoring uh, elementary school, school students, um, a significant evaluation of the training program um, which is, we're undertaking in several communities um, across the country. So this is the KSTPP partnership. This is community uh, with universities. Um, working together in this space that's created, in this place that's created uh, with the two partners. This space has been named the ethical space by a, a wonderful indigenous scholar, uh, Willie Ehrman from Western Canada. So this is co-creating knowledge, this is co-learning uh, throughout the process. And very key has been the community advisory board formed right at the beginning, guides all aspects of the research process and the intervention and the training. Key also to know that they are the ethics board for this project. So all new research is first presented to the community advisory board, and once they have discussed it, um, made the modifications that they feel are, are uh, required, uh, they issue a certificate of approval. And then the researcher includes this certificate of, of approval uh, when they apply to the uh, relevant university for research. Um, ethics approval. Um, right at the beginning, we also developed our own code of research ethics. So this precedes all of the codes uh, that were existing in Canada at the time. And then later, with several years of experience, we revised it. So this code starts at the beginning with the principles and the appendices um, show in great detail how these principles should be uh, put into practice. So of course, not without challenges. Um, always the challenge of finding ongoing research funding and ongoing funding to support the interventions. Um, the issues of being based in the community as opposed to a university, so the lack of the core funding. Um, time, <laughs> always an issue. The external timelines that we all work with uh, versus the time that we need internally um, for all the discussions and to come to consensus. And in a long-standing project like this, obviously the changing players in intervention and in, and in research. So I'd like now to um, turn over to uh, Morgan Phillips, who is here instead of Trina Delormier, who's in your program, because Trina was unable to come today. Did 
What does it work? Um, like she said, my name is uh, Morgan Gahanduni Yujits, uh, Gahanduni Yujits, that's my Mohawk name. I'm uh, from the Ganyangahaga Nation, which is just about 15 minutes from here on the South Shore. Um, so I'm, uh, I've been asked to talk a little bit about my experiences, five minutes at, from the, at the Ganyangahaga Schools Diabetes Prevention Project and how I got involved. So how I got involved with the uh, KSDPP was back in uh, 1994 when it first began. So I was asked to become part of the Community Advisory Board. At the time, my mother had just passed away. She was diabetic, so I felt that I had to become part of this movement that, that had just started to, to um, because, because the elders had already made the decision to stop this disease in our community or to do something about it. And because of our culture, in our culture, part of our philosophy is um, what we call the seven generations philosophy. And it's, it's in our teachings that any decisions that we make today always has an effect on that seventh generation that we're never going to see. So all the decisions that we make today uh, is very important for that. What are we going to leave for that generation? So I became part of KSDPP at the very beginning. Over the years, as a community advisory board, we became involved in uh, um, uh, school interventions, community interventions, volunteering. At the time, I was working for the uh, high school in my community. But later on, as the years went on from 1994, um, uh, later on, I was working for uh, the Mohawk Council of Kahnawake. This was like around 2001 and 2002. And I, and I actually became a research assistant at, at KSDPP, so I got a taste of research. And I see John Salzberg sitting in the audience there. And with, with, with the, the encouragement from KSDPP and, and Anne McCauley, Alex McCumber, is Alex? Alex, are you here? Okay. Anyway, so I remember when I was working at the Mohawk Council and um, they were doing community consultation. It was a land land related issue. And so I, I call up John. I said, remember that nudist program? It was... Uh, uh, qualitative data, data analysis program that I got I, I, I got a taste of and so I used that uh, um, qualitative data analysis that were in my workplace and and that was it for me I got a taste of research and because of uh, the encouragement from KSDP and John and all the people there I, I went back to school in 2004 I got my bachelor's, I got my bachelor, my, my master's, and now I'm just getting ready to submit my doctoral uh, dissertation in January. So if it wasn't for KSDPP, I wouldn't be standing here. So anyway, it's, there's, we, we've done a lot of good in the community. Research has changed the landscape in our community. Like Anne mentioned earlier about helicopter research, um, a lot of indigenous people don't trust researchers because of the way things were done in the past. So we're changing things and because of our strong ethics and, and, and now we're able to train researchers, the younger generations that are coming up in terms of, we're decolonizing the research by um, uh, training other researchers and, and non-indigenous researchers to become allies with us and to come and work together with us, not the research, it's not about us or on us, it's with us now. So that's just one of the message that I, the message that I wanted to, uh, take for you to take home. That's about it for me. Is that five minutes? All right. Okay, Nyawa. Hi everyone, uh, I, we are coming to you um, and very grateful to be here. Um, I formerly from Wisconsin and Scott from Wisconsin, we're representing uh, the partnership we have, a long-term academic community partnership with the Menominee Nation. Um, I've been privileged to be partners with Menominee for the past 
20 years, um, I started out there as a resident uh, working in the clinic um, when I was pregnant with my daughter, as <laughs> Scott remembers well. And uh, she's turned 20 uh, last weekend, so that's how I calculate how long I've been with Menominee, which is kind of fun. And I wanted to say that um, we have a few things to tell you today. I want to talk about this partnership and how it's evolved over the years. Menominee's a small community. It's also a county. It's in northern Wisconsin. It has about 4,700 people who are living on the reservation. And it's very beautiful. It has a beautiful river running through it, which you can just see um, beneath where it says Menominee there. We started out really trying to ask things, trying to understand how the community viewed health. What was considered a healthy child? How did the community define health? And what were the supports or barriers to children being healthy? And then what was a healthy community? We started out trying to, again, like uh, KSDPP, trying to prevent diabetes, trying to prevent chronic diseases on the reservation, but realized we had to go way back into early childhood. We have a, a timeline here I'm gonna talk us through. And um, we're calling this the Menominee Journey to Wellness because this is how they define the, their, their time. The partnership started in 2000, right after I became faculty at the University of Wisconsin. We did a, a large epidemiologic study of about 450 children um, in three reservations in Wisconsin, including Menominee Nation, and then got together as those communities and designed an intervention called Healthy Children, Strong Families that was um, funded by NIH in two different randomized control trials. One of those interventions also contained money to start a community advisory board, and that started in 2007 and got a lot of really great work done in the community. And then that evolved and became part of a much larger community engagement work group that was begun by the community and funded by a variety of different mechanisms, but really based in the community, which is an open um, advisory board and action board got getting a lot of things done. It started in 2011, and they started to focus on childhood obesity and prevention, realizing that early childhood was a really critical time as well. In 2014, we had a large uh, Wisconsin Partnership Program fund, um, funded um, obesity prevention grant, and Menominee Nation is one of the demonstration communities for the state because they've been doing such great work in this area. In 2015, the tribe adopted the community engagement work group process as a model for cross-agency work, which means the group got even larger. So it's about 60 or so people from agencies all across the community that meet on a quarterly basis, and then the individual groups meet uh, monthly to get work done. I'm going to show you some of the things we're working on in a minute. But in 2015, as a result of all of the work that the Monomination had done in terms of trying to improve their health, they won the Robert Wood Johnson Culture of Health Prize. This is the model that we came up with um, with the community um, to really try and understand what were some of the reasons that the community was struggling with chronic diseases and other problems. And note that we started with what was healthy and then kind of are, are moving into some of the more deeper issues as we've gotten um, through time. And one of the big issues that uh, all Native communities face, all Indigenous communities face worldwide is historic trauma. Of, and these are the particular pieces from Menominee, but very similar for um, all Native communities in terms of loss of identity and traditions. Uh, in, in Menominee's case, termination of n nation status, the boarding school era in which children were taken away from their families, and then, you know, abject genocide in many cases, leading to a lot of internalized um, issues that were causing, and part of what we were considering adverse childhood experiences that, as we all know, lead to um, chronic illness later on. There was also a piece of this current community norms, including this intergenerational risk perpetuation and lateral violence um, leading to, again, these, these ACEs. This kind of pain, fear, anger cycle leads to then unhealthy relationships with multiple um, substances or relationships, as we would say, and that then causes uh, problems in, that are sort of seen downstream in the community. So the three issues we've been working on in that group are teen pregnancy rates, um, obesity and chronic disease, and school readiness. Um, and the entire community has been working to put a trauma-informed lens on all of the, um, from the schools to the healthcare centers to any of the social service agencies um, to the police. I'm going to turn it over to Scott now, who's going to talk about what the exciting work is that they're doing at present. Good afternoon. And good morning, I guess, in this time zone. Uh, my name is Scott Krieger, and I do work at the Menominee Tribal Clinic. Uh, I've been there for 22 years, where Alex measures time by her daughter's age. I, I try to do time by how far my hair has receded and how gray my beard is. So 
Uh, it's been a while. Uh, we're going to talk briefly, and I know we have a very brief amount of time, on collective impact and community organizing. The first slide shows uh, what we have done, set up our, our collective impact with our agencies in, within the tribe. Uh, it really centers around the five core values of collective impact being a having a common agenda, shared measurement, mutually reinforcing activities, uh, continuous communication and back backbone support. A lot of times we have had lots of agencies receive grant money for the same goal and really siloed as far as what they were doing and what we were doing. So this has really brought our backbone team together. Uh, we have about six agencies that really work hard, look at food sovereignty and uh, where our food is coming from and trying to get locally grown uh, food. Really quickly looking at the next few slides, this uh, is one thing that we set up for our Minami Wellness Initiative on the core values. Can't see it very well, but it really centers around uh, what we are striving for. We're looking for, um, at looking at our indigenous knowledge, looking at that we have local knowledge that has gone back thousands of years. Uh, an archeologist was 10 miles up from the clinic and found uh, ancestral garden beds on the Wolf River that are uh, dating back to about 500 AD. Uh, we know that Manami was an agricultural society to begin with, so we're trying to re reinforce what uh, great uh, community uh, sovereignty we had long ago. This next slide is talking about our uh, strategic plan. Uh, again, may not be able to see it all, but really reinforcing an idea that when we first set up this project, we were looking at the basics of how to increase physical activity and how to get healthier food into the diet. Um, we really quickly realized that we would not be able to look for ideas that we could go through for a longer gener more generations unless we put lifting up indigenous knowledge very first so we moved them into that yellow section right there we we can't do anything to sustain our our, our goals unless there's indigenous knowledge in place and a university has done an outstanding job recognizing that recognizing that um, having evidence-based knowledge um, and practice uh, will come from the society that we're working with right now. A uh, quick picture of, uh, we just had a meeting on Wednesday, and if you could look at the, the person at the table at the computer, that's our liaison with the university. She does an outstanding job just being able to sit back and take some notes, knowing that we're driving this uh, goal, we're driving these strategic values in place. Um, she knows when we need some background, uh, backbone support, and we know, uh, we know when to rely on her as well, too. So it's a very, very mutually inclusive uh, group. Some of the real basic goals that we have been able to work within our agencies, uh, we've recently increased recreation center accessibility by having a 24-hour access. We have a lot of shift workers on the reservation uh, unable to have access to recreation center uh, equipment. Uh, we have worked with the Master Gardeners program at our local level with our 4-H clubs and our Boys and Girls clubs to have um, outstanding programming. Uh, we recently completed a food sovereignty grant uh, that will create some more buy-in within the community, and we are looking at our food code and food project, as well as a future tribal farm system. And our College of Minami Nation has a sta sustainable development institute. Uh, they work uh, freestanding, plus they, they work with the university as well. And they also have a farm school coordinator and VISTA worker collaboration has really helped transcend what we're trying to do at the local level. Uh, really briefly on community organizing. Um, we have a full-time community organizer. Um, he likes to say his, his goal is to agitate the community. And by that meaning, not just waiting for leadership to move forth some goals, but looking at what the community thinks and what they can do to move forward on some um, activities. Uh, Menominee has um, th their story dating back to the Menominee River, and right now there's, there's a mining operation that is being proposed. So they've gone through and um, worked with um, the villages and the cities along that river to try to 
help uh, block some of that. So they, they're sometimes political, but also they're, they're looking for the best interest of the, of the tribe. All right, this policy systems environmental change, obviously that's what we're trying to uh, move forward on. Uh, we not only want to build people's uh, knowledge base, we also want political know-how, but we also want to build the narrative uh, for the future generations of the Menominee people. And lessons learned. Uh, we are looking at um, building upon existing knowledge, uh, can it strengthen cultural connections, and uh, slow, deliberate collaboration builds lasting relationships. And I know uh, we would not be doing 20 years of research if the university and the local system did not uh, trust each other. We always say we move forward at the speed of trust, and certainly 20 years of trust has bring, brought us forward. Thank you very much. Hello, good morning everybody. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here to present to so many learned researchers from all over the world. My name is Shirley Bighead and I'm the health director for Sturgeon Lake First Nation, a position that I've held for the past 31 years. I have the, been the only health director our First Nation has ever had. I'd like to thank the elder for the prayer. I was feeling a little apprehensive and speaking to such a large group but that kind of calm me down and, and uh, focus me a little better. And I thank you, Amelia, for that. So we've been involved in research, um, collaborative research for a number of years and have worked with Dr. Oh, I'm, oh OK, I better back up. You're probably wondering, well, what is this map of Canada? What it is is uh, I'm pr we're trying to show where Sturgeon Lake is. If you look in the middle, that's Saskatchewan. And about halfway up the province is Prince Albert, and we're 35 kilometers northwest of Prince Albert, so we're quite close to an urban area. But um, uh, we've worked uh, in collaborative research for about the last 15 years uh, with uh, Dr. Ramston. I won't go into our earlier research uh, relationships, were, which were not uh, very beneficial or useful to our community. But... Um, We've worked with uh, her, and she is an individual who's committed to working with the community to try to improve health outcomes through research initiatives. In, in our First Nation, we um, have a number of health programs and services. However, there are areas that are priorities that are not funded. So by our research research partnership initiatives, we have been able to look at uh, how to address those areas that are not funded and uh, move forward on them. So our relationship has been that of a collaborative, of cooperative collaboration. The community is involved from the inception of the proposed research project to the completion of it. And the information being shared with the community and any programs or services that uh, are required uh, as evidence through research. Um, so, I mean, in terms of working directly with the community, um, and my predecessor talked about helicopter research. That was actually our experience for years. We had individuals come in, want to survey us, and for different purposes, and when they, once they were done, they left, and we never knew what happened with the information. Um, with with um, the partnership with uh, Dr. Ramsden and Dr. Willie Ermine, uh, we now know that how precious that information is, um, not only for the researchers, but most definitely for ourselves if we want to act on, I was just checking to see if my five minutes was nearly up, uh, wanting to act on the priorities identified by the research, uh, our community. 
So in terms of moving through, we have skill development and capacity development are two of the cornerstones of a new research relationship. And when you work inclusively, that brings ownership, acceptance, and a strong desire to affect positive changes that are targeted towards improving the health status in our community. Um, I guess what, one of the things that I would like to talk about that is a result of working uh, in a collaborative partnership uh, with the researcher is uh, as the health director and senior health nurse, we felt that we knew, we knew what were the problems in our community that had needed to be addressed. And I talked about mental health addictions and STIs and their increasing rates in our community. Uh, so what we did was we developed a data collection instrument, a survey, and surveyed our membership. And we were absolutely shocked, I guess, to find that the number one health issue identified by our membership was the use and misuse of tobacco. I, w I wouldn't have thought that that would have been their priority. Um, acting on that, um, w with Viv, we worked together to develop what is known as the Green Light Program. I was teasing him last night. I said, I'll talk about the Red Light Program and the economic development aspect of that. <laughs> but <laughs> but maybe, if, maybe if funding keeps getting cut, <laughs> we'll look at something like that. But uh, <laughs> the Green Light Program, I'll get back, back on track here, is... <laughs> Or do you want the details of the red light program? <laughs> okay, the green light program is one wherein uh, a, if individuals are interested in having a smoke-free home to protect their vulnerable little ones, their elders, then what we will do is we will go and we'll talk to them. We'll do an education session with them on reinforcing those benefits and supporting them in whatever way we can. And they, uh, we give them a poster, we give them a fridge magnet, and more importantly, we give them a green light, a green light bulb that they place on the outside of their homes to signify that their home is a smoke-free home. And we're, at this point in time, we're up to 67% of our membership that uh, are smoke-free in their homes. <laughs> yeah. That is amazing. And of course, the next phase is to determine how to stop smoking, period. As a result of being involved in this, I, I must admit that even though I've been a health director for 31 years, I, have, uh, I was a heavy smoker for many, many years, more than I care to <laughs> not tell. But, um, uh, and I think as part of this, that was a motivator to get me to quit smoking. I actually smoked for 43 years, and I've been smoke-free for five, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that is the way that we conduct research in Sturgeon Lake with our main researcher and our community members in order to affect positive changes that will address the community's priorities, not mine, not Norma's, not Viv's, but what does the community want to want us to work on to assist them in improving their own health status. Anyways, thank you very much for listening to me. I'm, I forgot to say I'm a Cree First Nation woman <laughs> from Sturgeon Lake. And thank you very much for listening. Um, first of all, I say Tansa is my Cree um, hello, and my Indian name is uh, Southern Wind Thunderbird one, Woman. And so I always want to say my name because it's a connection to to this to the creation. Um, so I'm a nurse for Sturgeon Lake for the past uh, 19 years, but I've been a nurse over 29 years. So. Um, it's been a privilege to be working in a very innovative community that has taken their health services at, uh, at community level. 
and an opportunity to work with the community in addressing some of the health trends that we're seeing and using f research as a vehicle to affect change. So one of the things that I started when I first started in Sturgeon, um, we looked at, we thought that we, are, we were practicing our usual um, nursing and working with the community and the clients, but when, what Shirley said was that we did try and find out what are the main concerns. And one of the things that the clients or patients or community members um, always said was that they've been using, they've been living with a lot of, um, uh, for instance, diabetes. Um, they said that they've been not getting better, even though they see the doctor and still their health is still, um, not stabilized and so they there's a lot of one of the things that they have identified was the um, inconsistent care for diabetes and so there was an overuse of um, walk-in clinics so and you know the what we see today is that there's an overutilization of the walk-in clinics and there's no um, coordinated care so that was the research question that we I, we wanted to find out how many of our our, our people were living with uh, um, their their diabetes was not stabilized. So that's what, what that research question started from. So, and this is where we are today. And so that question, the opportunity to work with a physician, to work together and um, finding out how can, we, how can we look after our clients. So for us, um, our model for as indigenous people are where we view life as the whole person, holistic view. And so if we're, we want to address the physical aspect and the emotional aspect and the spiritual aspects and the um, mental aspect. And a lot of the things that are physicists today, they concentrate on the physical well-being. One of the things that our, our clients say is that there's a lot of um, the spiritual and emotional aspect of our, our clients are not being well looked after. So as an Indigenous community, we envision incorporating, harmonizing the two Western approaches and an Indigenous worldview and how we um, support our clients. So through research, and that is the reason why research has been really a, a very important uh, vehicle to address in, in, in actualizing that model in our community using our, our strength in the community, using our healers, using our elders, using our grandmothers, using our families, and then number one, the family, direct the family supporting the individual. And it is the individual that will tell you the, what, is, what is going on in their life. It, after all, they're experts of their own health. So we've been learning with the clients, and through research, we've been We've been identifying that. So, with that, for opportunities for for, for opportunities for for change in our community, um, participatory health research has been really an important vehicle for us to to use because, in that respect, it, it is a mutual relationship where we get a chance to design the research and um, and and also talk about what healthiness means to us as Indigenous people. And we want to, one of the things that our elders tell us is about the natural law of um, change. That change comes from within and that you have to create a healthiness or a vision of wellness. And then there's great learning that needs to happen. And then you also have to look at your environment. So with that natural law being uh, shared with us, with our teachers, we have to also look at how we support our, our clients and our families and in the community. So all of those three intersectorial has to be in alignment as well. And also the four stages of, of life, which is your, 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 your child, your youth, your adult, and your elder. All of those have to also be part of that change. So with that, we've been using that kind of a indigenous uh, worldview with how we do our research. And that's why we say we have our way of utilizing that knowledge when we design the, 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 the research and um, the surveys. You can't just use a mainstream questionnaire. You also have to understand the social determinants of health that exist in the community, the language, 
you have to make it unique to fit us so you can really, you know, for us to really understand what, what we're trying to do. So the values of research needs to, it's really, when you use that model, it is builds humility and, um, and also looking at some of the areas where we're also is the sustainable funding. And so with this research, we, we have a number of projects right now that we're looking at um, addressing. We've surely talked about SGIs. Number one concern in Saskatchewan is HIV. So through research, again, we're doing that addressing. And what we're finding is that we have to use peers that are living with HIV because they have lived experience. And their most powerful impact in, in, in reaching the population in the community. So we, we, we utilize them as part of our research as well. So there's a number of, I didn't been, haven't been reading my slides here. So research today has shifted to become more inclusive of indigenous people and communities. And, um, and it's consistent with our indigenous values and it's process oriented and it's collaborative and experiential. We're doing a lot of also with our research is land-based um, opportunity for researchers to come and see our culture and experience what we what we're, t we're what we basically been talking about and it also allows for local control and participation of research uh, process within so uh, participa participatory research is a recognition of power knowledge and strengths that the community possesses so lessons learned, community-based health research provides essential elements in community building and empowerment. And it remains the proper property of the community and the community owns the problems and solutions. So our long-term goal is to build capacity and continue uh, ad advocating for self-determination through research. So as the person who actually gets to follow up at the end, um, I want to actually just add my thoughts around the work of being a researcher in it and with an Indigenous community. One of the interesting things is quite often the researcher designs the questions, and you heard that, in fact, Sturgeon Lake designs the questions. The biggest thing is that they call you up and they say, we have a question. We don't know how to answer it, but we have lots of ideas about what it is that we want to do. So in, in responding to the needs of the community, it's not about them or I, but the we in coming together. And so I just want us to be thinking about the we, the us, because without that, neither one of us can actually uh, be engaged in the process in a meaningful way. So we're now at the place where no research with Indigenous people should be done without them being involved. And where trust is present, the research undertaken has moved forward from clinical questions. And those questions are answered by the response rates of 99%. How many of you have response rates of 99%? When the community is engaged, they are answering and asking and answering. And as a result of that, it's not the researchers that actually engage in this. It is the entire community that engages in the research that we're involved in. So you've heard lots about over, over the last few days probably, nothing about us without us. It's the same story. We need to be actually present and willing to participate rather than in fact think we're going to run and manage the project. So now as a result of this, I'm going to go over there for a minute. been an interesting opportunity to put together. 
And so we have lots of thank yous. We'd like to thank the community members, all of you, for being here. We'd like to thank the elder for sharing your time with us and to actually open and close session. And you will be coming to do that in just a second, Amelia. And we'd like to thank NAFCRAG because in 1998, you developed a policy statement that talked about participatory research. Guess what you did? This is it. And then there's a whole bunch of leadership related to patient-centeredness. We have patients sitting on the board, both from Canada and the United States. That's amazing. I'm trying to get that to happen in Canada. We're not there yet. So I'm encouraging my colleagues who are Canadians here to think about are the patients sitting on boards that actually can contribute to our knowledge and learning in a new way. And last of all, I'd like to thank all of the community members in, in the entire uh, audience today because it's without them that we wouldn't be where we are today. So I'd like to call on Amelia to actually come and close our session and we will actually answer questions after the closing of the session. Short and sweet, two minutes. Let's go to Nyawagidzakanyitskwatanayduwatarastuma, <laughs> Just to uh, explain in uh, English, that uh, I thank everybody for being here uh, and uh, uh, the, the talk that we we're about to have, and also to uh, let everybody know that uh, welcome to. Kanyokehaga Mohawk Territory, and we're only 10 minutes south <laughs> across the Mercier Bridge. So everybody's welcome to come and visit. Nyawa. So I think we have time for a, probably two or three questions, or maybe more if they're short. So. We'll try and answer them if you'd like to. I think there are mics out there. Okay, Mary, good job, well done. <laughs> so I wanna thank all of you so much for being here today, sharing your stories, sharing your collective wisdom, being up there on that stage. I know those lights are bright, I know that's difficult. So your years of engagement, your attention to the practice of research has really informed so much of the work that is happening in this community and in this room. And I do want to say that for the rest of us who also work in community engagement, I feel like oftentimes we're standing on your shoulders for the work that we're able to do and do with competence and confidence. When we talk about community engagement, oftentimes there are, there are lots of questions about, well, but how do you really do it? And obviously you've shown that it can really be done and done easily and done with longevity at the speed of trust. Thank you for that. I will use that again and again. But one of the questions that kind of gets people that they, they get really hung up on is, but what happens when the funding goes away? What happens when there are these little gaps of time when I don't have those grant dollars coming in and, and gosh, how do we sustain? And so with your years of collective wisdom, can you speak a little bit about, well, what do you do during the the droughts and the dry spell. And thank you so much. So Morgan, did you want to start? I think it's on. Hello? Hello? Oh, okay. 
Thank you for your question. That was a very good question. Um, so the Gunnawaga Survival School Diabetes Prevention Project has been in, um, um, in existence since 1994, and we've had a lot of ups and downs. We've run out of, at the beginning, we actually had, it was a few million dollars at the beginning, and, and when that money ran out, I, I think it's, the, like we all talked about, it's the investment in the community and the ownership that the community takes. And so you, that's where you get the grassroots strength from the community and the culture. And um, if, you can, if you can get that momentum going, um, it, it's not really about funding all the time. So, so the people at KSDPP, we've maintained our sustainability from sometimes with barely any money, like skeleton staff. And that's, if you've ever come to KSDPP, we don't have no big fancy building. We have a little tiny building and everybody comes in and does their volunteering, but it's the ownership of the community that takes, takes, takes uh, because we care about the children and we care about those future generations. So if, if, if you have that culture and that strength in your community, I think that has a lot to do with it. Yeah, I'll just add, um I've been at the clinic for 22 years, and I'm on my second week of not working for a grant. I've always had something, and I think that really speaks to the fact that we always look at building capacity, uh, building, um, looking at First Nations grant money and other grant money, but also the fact that now uh, my boss has trusted me, and, and now he knows that we can go do things within the community that are based on moving forth that agenda that we've placed 20 years ago, 15 years ago, and even five years ago, that we're trying to build a healthier community. And um, as, as our, our medical staff has increased and our dental staff and our pharmacy staff, uh, we still rely on preventive medicine and really trying to create a healthier generation uh, within the Menominee community. For Sturgeon Lake, uh, what we've done in the past and what we will continue to do is, because we have the ability to do so as a transferred First Nation, where we are able to set our own priorities for funding, is to determine what what um, the community has um, identified as issues and to address them. We, for example, traditional health. We are a First Nation health center, so it's, it were, it's our responsibility to offer both methods of healing to our community members and to ensure the development of that program for generations to come. But when we started that one, we didn't have any money. We just kind of took a little bit from here, a little bit from there, and, and our developments were very slow but steady. Uh, but after many years, we were able to negotiate a large amount of funding to allow us to utilize specifically that pot of funding and not from other programs. Uh, uh, the, another one is the STI, HIV AIDS. Again, that was a, a priority that needed to be addressed based on our increasing statistics. And we, we decided that we would fund the work necessary in the community to support those um, who were afflicted and uh, their families. And again, we did it with very little money. It was $1,900 a year. Um, but we have since been able to negotiate a substantial amount of funding that allows us to deliver the program and expand it, working with uh, membership who do have the um, STIs. With, uh, there's another program, it's, uh, it's called Access. And what it is, is there's 12 sites in Canada, we're one, uh, both First Nation and non-First Nation that are in the process of developing along with youth effective programs to help them to address their mental health issues, looking beyond the standard medication and hospitalization and dealing with the ostracization. So, and our commitment on that one is once it, the five-year project, we're halfway through, is completed that we are looking for funding, but ir irregardless of whether we do receive funding, we will continue with that essential project. And that's kind of what we do in Sturgeon Lake, and it's, we were giving a boost, if you will, by 
participating in different research projects. That was how initially we were able to go beyond our $1,900 a year in HIV and AIDS to start to work on a program that was that's more responsive to the needs within our community. And that was one of the, the our first projects and very successful. Okay, thank you. So if I could just add a comment. We always have money. It's not necessarily grant money, but there's always opportunity to find little pots of money. And so as a result of that, we've always continued to ask questions and answer them with the community and in the community. So I guess the biggest thing for me is we just got our CIHR grant, which is a big to-do in Canada. And as a result of that, we're looking at how to improve and build on the green light program at, at Sturgeon Lake. So it's a very exciting time for all of us. I know that there was a question at the back. So, okay, Ivy. Thanks, Viv. Uh, Ivy Anderson from the College of Family Physicians of Canada. Um, so recently in the last few years, uh, the College of Family Physicians of Canada and the Society of Research, uh, Society of um, uh, Rural Physicians of Canada came up and we developed a, a roadmap for action uh, to improve equity and care uh, in rural and remote Canada. Those are on our websites. One of the key issues in the last week is I was able to go uh, with, uh, to meet with Minister Philpott, uh, her, uh, her staff, one of her staff members, and it was very clear that in future, uh, they will not be looking at anything without the voice of the community in terms of looking at um, ideas and grants, that there needs to be a mobilization of communities working with our national organizations or our provincial organizations. So the question that I have is, um, one of the big things that Minister Philpott had said in Canada was she wanted to hear the cries of babies in the north again. And we had heard that. And we know that to do that we need to actually look at improving networks of care, we need to improve the ways in which we can actually educate people to actually provide care in the north and the rural areas. For us to have that wonderful want to do something, we need to partner with communities to understand how to do that. My question to the panel is, what advice would you provide for how we can get the communities to mobilize with us to c create a collective in order to answer this important question of equity and access in rural and remote communities, particularly as it relates to maternity care, um, so that we can hear the cry of babies in the north again. Thank you for your question. Uh, maybe I'll start with you, Morgan. Hello. J just very briefly, uh, maybe community consultation. Uh, one of the projects that I'm involved in right, right now is with uh, Dawson College in, in Montreal, and it's uh, called the First Peoples Post-Secondary Storytelling Exchange Project. And one of the things that Dawson College is, is doing is uh, gathering community members. In fact, last week they, they uh, invited, there was different nations, there was people from the Mohawk communities, uh, people from the Cree communities, Inuit, and they, and they gathered us in a room in Montreal and they, and they consulted with us. They asked us, um, how can we close the gap in this area? How can we close the gap in this area? And they provided a meal. So that got us there. So it's all about food too. <laughs> so that's, that's just one idea. So Norma, I know that you're uh, a traditional uh, midwife. So do you want to comment on that particular question? How, how can you get the community involved in hearing the babies cry in the north? In other words, keeping babies in the north and actually encouraging us to work together rather than, in fact, taking from. Um. We're, we're actually in the middle of... Um well, I myself was born uh, in a cabin with uh, my, my uh, auntie being a midwife. So I saw the, um, the importance of uh, home, home births right 
and then also following the traditions, uh, birthing ways. Um, there is, I admit, there is a generational gap. Um, we are in the process of fighting for midwifery, for instance, to try and restore the birthing in our community. And Saskatchewan, um, unfortunately, only has uh, 15 midwives, and so there is a, a need to bring back. So we, we started to um, uh, work with the, uh, a researcher by the name of Angela Bowen. She's a midwife, and she's approached us to see if this is something that is a priority for a community, and yes, it is. The, the ground, I guess you could say, is fertile. So now we're, we're gathering, engaging with the young moms. And those, that question, we asked, the, we asked that question to the, the young population, and they didn't know what a midwife was. So, but we asked our grandma, our, our elder, and she remembers. So it's about, a, we're building that knowledge right now. And so I know the rest of Canada, there's midwives, and it is, we want to restore those traditional birthing ways and also because restoring that power back to the woman is very vital for, to build a healthy community. And it is very important topic for our community and uh, just um, we're fighting for that. And I myself, uh, I'm getting my knowledge base and I'm not a midwife, but I, I, I've been in a hospital and, and accidentally uh, delivered two babies once in a nursing station. So yes, we need to shift that back to the community and it's about engaging and asking about healthier babies because we see too many, um, um, lots of stories about, um, horror stories about um, losing babies. And there is a ceremony that people need to understand that when you lose a baby, we have to do a ceremony to to, uh, to um, I guess it's um, dealing with the grief, unresolved grief, when you lose a, uh, whether it's stillborn or a miscarriage, and that's something that um, um, is the, the spiritual aspect of the healthiness of the individual and the community because it affects the community. So I don't, I don't want to leave the family physicians out of this. So Anne McCauley, would you like to respond to the question of how we might engage communities in developing um, projects together, whether it be about uh, babies in the north or whether it be in inner cities? No? No? You're okay? Well, I guess one of the, the things for me is that we can't do it separately and apart. It needs to be the community, it needs to be family docs, it needs to be nurses, and we need to be actually engaged together. And I guess I'm gonna frame the question or the comment around consultation. I'm really sort of challenged by the word consultation because often we don't take the results of consultation. We actually just listen and then go on and do what we want to do. So I'm going to encourage us to actually authentically engage rather than consult so that in fact the outcomes of the work actually changes who and what we do. Okay, there's one last question. So my name is Tree Sink. I'm a family physician from the United States, the state of Ohio. And some of us have enough gray hair to remember when community participatory research was a new concept at NAPCRAG, and we know it's hard work. So I'm wondering for the newer researchers in the room if you can uh, talk about one of the hard points, hard times, of collaborating between researchers and communities and what it took to get through that? Well, I know that there are a number of new researchers in the room, and I can't say that I'm new anymore, but one of the interesting dynamics of engaging in participatory research is that it takes longer to actually write papers and get the research results in a way that's going to be meaningful to the community. So from the perspective of my work, I actually was very successful in moving through from assistant professor to professor in eight years by just doing the work. And I, I say that because it's a matter of doing it one day at a time, engaging the community and, and thinking that the work is valued whether or not you actually achieve each of the steps. And 
brilliantly enough, it was successful in moving it forward. And so I guess I'm encouraging people to just do the work. And in doing the work, the passion will actually drive it forward. I have nothing else to add. I'm going to. Yeah, okay, it is. I'm going to comment on that because um, I mentor a lot of junior researchers now in this area, and um, I myself had good mentoring from Anne in this area. And um, I really think that the importance of that piece uh, should not be underestimated um, for investigators that are struggling with this because there are challenges and ups and downs, and you have to convince your department and your chair and your dean that this is worthwhile, that this community engagement work that takes longer and has less papers um, is you know, just as important as research that doesn't have those things um, to contend with. The other thing I think is, is the speed of trust piece is really important. You have to trust that this work that you're doing is good work and that it's important. And if you're able to um, hold that um, in tension with what you need to get done, but with really being honest with the community about that, I think you will be successful. Um, but looking to your, your elders now, as it were, um, is also an important piece so that those hard times you can get through. Just one more thing too, it's about building relationships, like trust, it goes with the trust. And like she said, it takes, sometimes it takes a little bit longer. So for example, you might go into the community with good intentions, but it takes a long time to, as Amelia would say, to sit at the kitchen table and have discussions and take your time because we don't move fast. As indigenous people, we like to take our time. We got to watch you, we got to examine you, and we got to see if, if you're really having good intentions of helping our communities. So it takes time to build that trust. So, so just bear that in mind too, Miala. So the message that I hear is find a mentor. Find a mentor. Anyway, we're going to close this session and thank you. I'd like you to thank my colleagues again for the wonderful job that they did of sharing their information with you tomorrow. <laughs> and Mark, did you have any last minute words? Only last minute words are to thank you very much for a, an engaged and interesting uh, panel discussion. Um, next is the poster session and a reminder, 1030 is our second morning plenary with Dr. Amanda Howe, the president of Wonka. So please come back here to this room at 1030. Thank you.